You'll notice that these two popes mysteriously died, and I've explained that in our last world history class. So I'm not going to explain it again. But the Pope, notice the gap between them when they died, right? So we're going to cover these Popes. It was fresh during the time of the Cold War, these three Popes. The, the Pope behind it and the Pope after it, they had mysterious deaths. And so there's a lot of conspiracies. There's a lot of strange suspicion going on on how these Popes died and what was going on. And actually, I read some secular sources not a lot of them really deny it. So even though they'll say it's conspiracy, they can't resist in seeing there's a huge suspicion with the way they died. But if you know about Catholic conspiracies that I covered ever since the beginning of this class, this should be no surprise to you. But especially during the 20th century, they've got intelligence agencies now. They got intelligence agencies where they're spying on each other. They got elites into CFR, into politics. Remember how uh, Pope Pius XI, he was involved in promoting fascism and Nazism. But then he was leaning more toward the left side. He had more empathy toward uh, the Bolshevik or the communist side. However, what happened is that he was quickly put out of the way. And all of a sudden, now Pope Pius XII came, and you might remember, he was the main guy who was there during World War II and supported Hitler's regime and Mussolini. So that was very strange. And then all of, uh, all of a sudden, the communists are coming in. So because the communists are coming in, we're entering the Cold War. Three main groups you want to know for anti-church history. Vatican, obviously. Second, Washington, D.C. And the third is Moscow, all right? Avram Manhattan wrote a book called The Vatican, Moscow, Washington Alliance. It's a highly recommended book. He went through the entirety from World War I to the end. Now remember, let, let me review our history. Don't forget your history. I stress this so many times. I know that I go redundant speeches before I get to the main point, but it's because we all forget. So we must remember our history. I hope you really remember what I told you in our previous history, previous history classes. Go back to World War I. Remember all the world, or Europe mainly, the European powers, and America is aligned with Europe, remember? The European powers, there's one country that they always uh, kept an eye on, and that's Russia, remember? Yeah. Ever since World War I. Now remember, the Catholic Church, that's why they went on like their own jihad against them. And that was against the Orthodox Church. That's why they supported the Bolsheviks, remember? Mm -hmm. The Bolshevik Revolution. But the Bolshevik Revolution, or the Communists, it didn't turn out well. According to Alberto Rivera, the Bolsheviks betrayed the Vatican. Avro Manhattan, what he proved was the Vatican did side with the Bolsheviks at the beginning, but all of a sudden they switched places. They concentrated toward the European powers. They were supporting the European powers. So communists took over Russia, and then World War II was coming in, so then the Vatican wants to pay back the communists. Their prize star, who was he? Adolf Hitler. Okay. But then we've seen how Adolf Hitler became a madman, and everything was falling apart. So according to Alberto Rivera, the Jesuits had a diabolical plan and plot. They made sure that their own Catholics got persecuted too, just in case Hitler lost World War II. But anyway, Edmund Paris's book is more than evidence, The Secret History of the Jesuits. It proves, hands down, that is probably the most documented book I ever saw to prove the Vatican had ties with Nazis in World War II. Wow. I mean, that is as demonic as you can get. All you need is that book, and that's all you need. You don't even need Abra Manhattan's book. So Edmund Paris's book uh, proved that hands down, like I told you last time. But now they lost World War II. So what's going on? As you remember in our last discipleship class, the colonization from the European nations, they're backing out now. So India gets its freedom. Some parts of uh, China is getting it. Vietnam is getting it. That's why the communists are coming in. Japan just left Korea, so Korea is about to face its own war. And the British, uh, Great Britain itself, England, which used to be the world's number one power, became now one of the, uh, dropped immensely. And it became 
Who are the two that uh, stood out who became the winners of World War II? Moscow and Washington, D.C., USA and Russia. That's why we're here today. There's a saying that if you control Europe, you can control the world, which is very true. Uh, I think it was Napoleon Bonaparte who said that. And you see America, who are they trying to follow? They always try to follow Europe for some stupid weird reason. If it wasn't for the Baptist distinctive in America, we would have been shot to hell a long time ago. That's why we're in this tension right now with Trump and Biden, what's going on. Because of that independent American freedom mindset that was planted from the Baptists a long time ago from our founding fathers. Amen. So that, even though, like I told you before, there wasn't much Christian behind the birth of America, there was one, and that's the Baptist distinctive of separation of church and state, which created a secular mindset of, I want my own independence and freedom. No one's going to control me or tell me what to do. So that's totally the opposite of the government, right? Telling you what to do, which is a communist agenda. So anyway, uh, if it wasn't for uh, the Baptist distinctive a long time ago, we would have died out a long time ago. So now we're in this tension. But knowing the framework and the background of history, now Moscow is going to battle Washington, D.C. And the Vatican, remember, they have to choose which side now, right? Vatican always... Uh, they always play the chameleon. They don't get the center of the world's attention. They always go behind somebody. Okay. They always go behind somebody else to do the dirty work for them, so that they can get the attention, and the Vatican will back them up. So remember, they supported the Nazis that time, and that is like the far right extremist group considered to be that time. Well, Pius XII is going to remain that way, so who is, he, who is he gonna support? Obviously, United States of America. That's what he's gonna go for. He is not going to support the communists. Communists have always been their enemy. So the Vatican, Moscow, and Washington, D.C. have always spied on each other. I read a little bit about that, which gave you some interesting stuff about what happened to these two popes, that they died mysteriously. Now I'm going to expound more on the spies. Did the Bible mention about this? The Antichrist, his government will have intelligence. He will have his own intelligence agents. It's important to understand that. Daniel chapter 11 and verse 30. This is about the Antichrist. For the ships of Chittim shall come against him. Therefore he shall be grieved and return and have indignation against the holy covenant. So shall he do. He shall even return and have what? Intelligence. Intelligence with them that forsake the holy covenant. And arms shall stand on his part, and they shall pollute the sanctuary of strength, and shall take away the daily sacrifice, and they shall place the abomination that maketh desolate. When the Antichrist sets up his abomination of desolation, he's not only going to have military might at verse 31, but in verse 30, He's going to have intelligence. Wow. He will have intelligence. And we've seen intelligence agencies going through the Kremlin, through the CIA, and the Vatican with their Jesuits and other Catholic spies. Now, here are some articles that I'm going to read. Now, before we get into it, let me just give a brief history of the 20th century. Uh, pretty much everyone can agree with this, but I'm just going to... Uh, read it in case. That way everyone can follow along and not get lost. Uh, the internet connection just died again. So here we go. Let me connect it and then I'll read you the articles. So we're entering the Cold War. Let me explain this historic timeline a bit. That way it's important we know the background of our history. That way you're going to understand the details that I get into. Okay. So I know sometimes it may be like a little dull or something you might go, well, I know. To be honest, no, you really don't know. I don't think so. So just try to pay attention to every word uh, that I read, and then you'll see the connections when I compare with other reading materials. You'll understand why it's important. All right. Now I'm going to read from Wikipedia uh, on the Cold War because pretty much uh, all other historical sources, they're going to agree with what they uh, – with what. I'm going to read about the Cold War here. During the Yalta Conference, where the Western capitalist powers and the communist Soviet 
Union agreed on separate spheres of influence on Europe, they set up the stage for a geopolitical rivalry that would dominate international relations for the next five decades. In March 1946, Winston Churchill gave a now famous speech while visiting Westminster College in the U.S., which is usually credited as the first use of the term Iron Curtain to refer to the separation of Soviet and Western areas of influence in Europe. So it's Western powers versus the Soviet or communist powers. Now remember, I told you that the Antichrist is more toward this side, Western powers. And then the rogue nations in the tribulation would be this side. Indeed, the Soviet Union have already annexed several countries as Soviet socialist republics during the war. So remember, uh, the communists, they took up a lot of land after World War II because they sent their soldiers. United States and Russia were the ones who were sending troops all over. And they were the winners who stood out. So then after World War II was over, Russia, the communists, they're not just going to leave those European countries, obviously. So because they have their military might there, they're able to try to stay in some of them or take over some of them. Eastern Poland, Latvia, Estonia, Lithuania, part of Eastern Finland, and Eastern Romania were now wholly part of Soviet Union. Furthermore, between 1949, uh, 1945 and 1949, Yugoslavia, Albania, Bulgaria, Poland, Romania, Czechoslovakia, Hungary, and East Germany saw communist regimes coming to power and their transformation into people's republics. So notice how much the communists are taking over European territory. That's really scary, actually, mm. to the Western powers. While they remain independent countries and their relation with the Soviet authorities would fluctuate over the next half century, they were widely seen as Soviet satellite states. Outside of Europe, countries that would see the rise of communism and would ally themselves to the communist bloc include, okay, so this is outside Europe now. What are the countries that joined, that the communists took over or joined the communist party? Mongolia, China, North Korea, Cuba, and Vietnam. The spread of the communist ideology in general and the Soviet influence in particular made Western leaders nervous. And it even led to Churchill considering a preemptive attack on the USSR even before World War II was formally ended. Wow. Fearful of a possible invasion of Western Europe by Soviet forces, or more realistically, Soviet subversion of Western governments, the U.S. set up clandestine stay-behind operations of armed resistance in collaboration with Western European leaders, which later evolved into Operation Gladio. The two rival blocs also coalesced, uh, coalesced into formal mutual defense organization with the formation of what you've heard about NATO. That's why NATO was formed. North Atlantic Treaty Organization in 1949 and the Warsaw Pact in 1955, each determined to expand its own influence among unaligned countries and limit the influence of their rivals. So it's important to see yeah, that they on. have politics, these yeah. talks. Because remember, who had all the nuclear armaments? America and Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. Because they were building so much nuclear warfare, that's the only thing that's, uh, they realize that they can't bomb each other out. That's really scary. So that's why these organizations are important to them. So they will have a warfare with each other, but within certain limits. So there are some rules being played out. So there are still rules that are laid out that they're not going to cross the line with. So think about this. Because they can't just use brutal force to take over, how else are they going to take over? That's why intelligence agencies are the most important to them. Do you realize that? That's why intelligence agencies are so much overused today. Because there's no way we can, like, we can't go back to the BCs. We just use brutal force like Alexander the Great. No, once you got nuclear warfare, that was it. Once nuclear bombs came out, everybody was freaking out. They're like, no, we're not going to go that far. So they put now certain limits. They've now put certain limits. This is where we are today. So I hope you understand that. That's why these organizations are very important to our world. Two, 
two wars and a near war in the 1950s became the focus for capitalist versus communist struggle. The first war was the Korean War. Okay, so we go to 1950 to 1953, the Korean War. Fought between People's Republic of China back North Korea and mainly United States back South Korea. The Korean Peninsula was a Japanese colony between 1910 and 1945. I am so clumsy today, I don't know what's off with me. Uh, when Soviet and American troops invaded and divided it along the 38th parallel. A communist government controlled the territory north of the border and a capitalist one controlled the south, with both authorities considering the other one illegitimate and claiming sovereignty over the entire peninsula. North Korea's invasion of South Korea on June 25, 1950, led to the United Nations intervention. General Douglas MacArthur led troops from the United States, Canada, Australia, Great Britain, and other countries in repulsing the northern invasion. However, the war reached a stalemate after Chinese intervention pushed UN forces back, and an armistice ended hostilities in July 1953, leaving the two Koreas divided and tense for the rest of the century. The second war, the Vietnam War, was perhaps the third most visible war of the 20th century after World War I and World War II. After the French withdrawal from its former colony on 21st July 1954, so remember, uh, European powers, they were colonizing. So France was colonizing Vietnam, now they backed out. This, after World War II, the whole world changed. The, uh, the European countries that colonize different nations are all backing out now. Our world has changed. The 20th century is so important. Lao de Saint age changed everything. Yeah. Vietnam became partitioned into two halves, much like Korea, along the 17th parallel. Fighting between North and South eventually escalated into a regional war. The United States provided aid to South Vietnam and contributed to propaganda efforts against the North. Come on but was not directly involved until the Gulf of Tonkin Resolution, passed in reaction to a supposed North Vietnamese attack upon American destroyers, brought the U.S. into the war as a belligerent. The war was initially viewed as a fight to contain communism. Uh, there's examples like containment, Truman Doctrine, Domino Theory, etc. But as more Americans were drafted, and news of events such as the Tet Offensive and My Lai Massacre leaked out, American sentiment turned against the war. U.S. President Richard Nixon was elected partially on a promise to end the war. This Nixon doctrine involved a gradual pullout of American forces. South Vietnamese units were supposed to replace them, backed up by American air power. The plan went awry, with Nixon deliberately sabotaging peace talks for political gain, and the war spilled into neighboring Cambodia, while South Vietnamese forces were pushed further back. Eventually, the U.S. and North Vietnam, side, uh, Vietnam signed the Paris Peace Accords, ending U.S. involvement in the war. With the threat of U.S. retaliation gone, the North proceeded to violate the ceasefire and invaded the South with full military force. Saigon was captured on April 30th, 1975, and Vietnam was unified under communist rule a year later, effectively bringing an end to one of the most unpopular wars of all time. The Vietnam War is probably one of the most dreadful war stories that I ever heard of before, and yes, there was a lot of messed up stuff behind the scenes here. Yeah. Uh, there is a lot of war propaganda. A lot of war propaganda. Now look, uh, I understand that if you're part of your country and you have to fight and you have to defend your own country, but when you look at politics, how they play out, how they deal with their enemies, I mean, it is so messed up. It is so weird. I mean, you're like, come on, just go on the offensive or think about this, think about that. It's either that or just back out, okay? Just back out. But the Catholic Church... What they decided to do is to side with the European powers or the Western powers. The Korean War, what happened is it still stayed as stalemate, half and half. The Vietnam War was the war that the United States, the great United States of America lost. You have to think about that. 
They never lost a war before, mm -hmm. United States of America. But why is it that at this time they fell? Well, this is the height of apostasy. What do you think? Yeah. That's when Great Awakening revivals ended. What do you think? Oh. Just use some common sense. Okay. So a lot of people don't want to connect spiritualism uh, with a country's success, but there's a lot of meaning behind that. There's a lot of meaning behind that. Now, which political belief that we go for? It's so easy. The simple answer is this, is that this kingdom of this world is not our own kingdom. Right. When every man rejects Jesus Christ, whether Republican or Democrat, they can try the best noble causes that they want for. Fine, have it your way, but I don't care if you're Christian. The point is, is that you can't bring the kingdom on earth yourself. We've learned that throughout the scriptures over and over again. Now, is there anything wrong? Am I criticizing people who want to vote or who want to support Christian causes within a political party? Of course not. Have at it. But if you put your, put your whole life to that one, your whole cause to that one, then you are wasting your time. Because this kingdom uh, that you can work for is only temporary. And it will change again. This is extremely interesting about Catholic involvement. They have to get involved with intelligence agencies, right? Can you guess which intelligence agency they're going to pick in America? Yeah, because I've said that several times, right? Yeah. <laughs> CIA, yeah. right? So it is the CIA. This is, I can't believe this, but you can find this very easily on a Google search. I didn't know that. This is from the Catholic Herald. I'm reading from the Catholic Herald. Their, their article. The title of their article is Why Catholics Thrive in the CIA. Here's their article right here. The CIA is the best known of the 17 agencies that comprise the American intelligence community. It has earned itself nicknames. What kind of nicknames? Like Catholic Intelligence Agency or Catholics in Action. <laughs> Did, they, did public schools ever teach you this stuff? Whoa. It's worth exploring why. Y yes, tell me. Now, isn't that funny? I've been reading Catholic articles who admitted that John White's booth, and it was the Catholics who sided with the Confederates. Remember that one? Mm. And it's funny how they're admitting about CIA right here, too. And it's just so funny. <laughs> you know why? Because you cannot, when you study history, this, this Vatican was all over. There's no way they can hide it, guys. The only way they can hide it is through different reasons why you would find a Catholic involved in that. That's the only way that they'll do it. Because they can't deny their involvement. History is plain as a nose on your face that Vatican tentacles were always somewhere with the bad guys. All right, but anyway. One interesting clue is the relatively high number of Catholics who have served as director of the agency. Wow. The United States is a country in which, with the recent exception of the Supreme Court, Catholics have never dominated the highest offices. So then they give the excuse about the presidential offices. But they mention this. By contrast, three out of the last five CIA directors have been Catholic. Michael Hayden, Leon Panetta, and the current director, John Brennan. Would you believe that? Wow. Looking back, a number of Catholics led the agency in critical periods when? During the Cold War. All right, so CIA, uh, not CIA, Catholic hands are behind this during the Cold War. There's no doubt about that. Or at least from this article, CIA, okay? But I'm going to show you proof it's more than just CIA. Some of the most influential directors in CIA history have been Catholic. Men such as Walter Bedell Smith, John McCone, William Colby, and William Casey. They were not just casual Catholics. They were devout mass goers. In many cases, members of groups like the Knights of, yes. Can you guess? Knights of what? Knights of Malta, right? Because I told you that several times too, right? Knights of Malta. The conspiracy theorists usually start there with nefarious <laughs> plots about the Vatican steering world affairs. 
Of course, they never ask why an all-powerful Vatican can't engineer more Catholic presidents. You know why? Because look at our current Catholic president. <laughs> you wonder why? You want the real deal, especially during this time? You go for intelligence agencies, fool. Because look at Trump. He even had the supposed biggest power. You think the whole world responded favorably to that? You have to do it sneaky. That's the guy who's going to control everything behind the scenes. All right. To make sense of Catholics and the CIA, you have to go back to the 1940s, before the agency even existed. Until that decade, the United States did not have a unified intelligence system. Separate branches of the military collected and analyzed their own intelligence. That changed with the Office of Strategic Services. This was the CIA's predecessor, responsible for espionage and sabotage operations during World War II. The OSS was founded and led by General William J. Donovan, whom history knows as Wild Bill, the founder or the basically the father of the CIA, before it was called CIA. Donovan was born into a poor Irish Catholic family in upstate New York. He experimented with other denominations while a student at Columbia University, though he remained devoted to Catholicism. He was also a, he made a fortune in Wall Street as well. So notice how Wall Street elites are combined with this, with Catholics. But that's not a surprise Come because on. we studied about the Kennedy's involvement in that, right? Concerning about the Great Depression, which bankers survived. And some of them were supporting the Bolsheviks, if you might recall. And some people from the round table were involved with that. Really strange, strange stuff. All right. So the title of the article, and it'll go down, I'm sure, you know, Why Catholics Thrive in the CIA by the Catholic Herald. Take a picture or look at that before they take it down. Okay. So the CIA is no doubt involved in that. I'm going to now read the articles by Avril Manhattan, obviously our go-to guy. Dr. Ruffman, uh, his go-to guy is Avril Manhattan's books on Catholic conspiracies. I regret that I did not look that up until when I was teaching world history. When I saw that, I realized that this is the biggest gold mine I ever saw. He has so many books, and I got almost all of them. <laughs> you know why? Because yeah. it's, not, it's, not on, it's not for sale as much anymore. You're really getting it out of print now. All right, so let's talk about uh, the history and the Catholic involvement. This is uh, Vietnam, uh, Why Did We Go, by Avro Manhattan. Chapter 7, The Men Behind the Vietnamese War, page 52. The formulators were ready at hand on each side of the Atlantic. In Rome, there was the most formidable and relentless anti-communist crusader of the century, named, namely Pope Pius XII. Okay, remember, this is uh, Hitler's pope. And this is the guy who's now on this anti-communist crusade here. In Washington, there existed his political counterpart. Now, here are important, here are important names you don't want to forget. Uh, let's see. The U.S. Secretary of State, John Foster uh, Dulles. John Foster Dulles was the center of powerful anti-communist groups and anti-Russian lobbies whose chief objective was in total harmony with that of the Vatican. These groups were disproportionately influenced by the Catholic elements and with few notable exceptions were supported by the Catholic Church in the U.S. So uh, John Dulles was very close uh, with Catholic powers. Second thing, his brother, Alan Dulles, was head of CIA. Here's another one. You ready for this? You know what denomination they were? This is another branch that has been a thorn on the side that followed Bible believers that corrupted the right crowd. Calvinists. Mm. And some of these dumb Calvinists publish a book, God's Man, John Dulles. Because he combined his religious belief, that post-millennial garbage doctrine, with what he's doing with kingdom building. 
So all that messed up stuff that happened in Vietnam and what you heard is because, listen, I hope everyone's watching me, especially those Calvinists who are trolling me, is because of a non-dispensational mindset. It is a post-millennial, amillennial type of mindset, kingdom-building mindset. Remember, a kingdom-building mindset has been always the violent part of our history. Hitler wanted to build a ki kingdom, Third Reich, a millennial kingdom. The Catholic Church wanted to build their kingdom of God on earth. Why do you think the Crusades happened? Because the Muslims agreed with the Catholics, we need to build our kingdom too. Ca that's why John Calvin even burnt up some people. Say believers. Say believers he burned at the stake. Our Anabaptist predecessors, they suffered what they call the third baptism, which is drowning them, you know, in a lake or a huge pond by what? Calvinists. Calvinists. Sorry, but Calvinism is a demon-possessed religion. Amen. I say that wholeheartedly. But that kingdom-building thing has been a, has costed lives. It murdered people. An anti-dispensational mindset produces this kind of fruit at the end. Bloody murder. All right. Anyway, I, I'm sure I made a lot of people happy after that. All right, page 54. Page 54. Oh, here's an interesting note. You, you, you ready for this? John Dulles, son, you know what happened to him? He, be, he was offered a cardinal position. He became Jesuit, too. After all, his family were intelligence agencies. And which group was good at intelligence agencies before? Jesuits. We knew that a long time ago. They practiced this spying tactic a long time ago during the Protestant Reformation. Anyway, all right. page 54. When, therefore, the Vietnam problem came increasingly to the fore, both the Vatican and the U.S. focused their joint activities toward that country. The chief formulators of the strategy were Secretary of State John Foster Dulles in the diplomatic field. And here's the other name you want to know. This is a big guy, Cardinal Spellman in the ecclesiastical. This guy was extremely powerful. He was the most powerful Catholic in America. They uh, nicknamed uh, his... Uh, his organization in New York, the Little Vatican, actually. There were even some talks that he would become the next pope. That's how powerful he, he was. The importance of the latter, this guy, was paramount, since Cardinal Spellman was the linchpin between Washington and the Vatican. This was so because Spellman had the ear, not only of powerful politicians and military men with the U.S., but equally that of the Pope, a personal friend of his. Other Catholic individuals play no mean part. One of these being, can you guess, John Kennedy, the future president. Quote, it is important that the Senate demonstrate their endorsement of Mr. Dulles's objectives, declared Kennedy at a secret meeting of congressional leaders on April 3rd, 1954. He continues, Kennedy says, if necessary, the U.S. will take the ultimate step, war. J.F. Kennedy was speaking as a political exponent of the powerful Catholic lobby in Washington. Here's another one, page 55. All right, I don't know if some of you knew about South Vietnam when it started, when the war started. Do you know uh, which religion stormed its way over there to fight against the communists? Can you guess? Can you guess? No, you wouldn't guess, you know. One of the first moves was, uh, page 55, one of the first moves was the selection of a man fit for the task. This was ready at hand. His name, I'm going to butcher the name, Ngo Dean Diem. All right, this is the guy who became one of the first leaders of South Vietnam before South Vietnam fell into communism. Diem had been carefully groomed by the what? Catholic establishment was an ardently religious person, a fanatical anti-communist, and a ruthless religious and political dogmatist. He had been watched for some time, both by the Vatican and certain individuals in the U.S. When the moment for the choice came, the decision was taken, 
mostly by American Catholics. The best known of these being Cardinal Spellman, Joe Kennedy, and his son, the future president, John F. Kennedy, and last but not least, by John Foster Dulles and Alan Dulles and their secret entourage. Diem had convinced himself that he had been chosen by God to fulfill a definite task, and that a day would come when he would be ready to carry out his mission. When he judged the time to be appropriate, he approached Cardinal Spellman, at this time the confidant not only of the Pope, but equally of powerful political figures in the U.S. Spellman introduced Diem to William O. Douglas of the Supreme Court. The latter introduced Diem to Mike Mansfield and to John F. Kennedy, both Catholics and senators. Alan Dulles, director of the CIA, adopted him following the decision of his brother, John Foster Dulles, and of Cardinal Spellman, who was acting for Pope Pius XII. Diem became their choice. He was going to be the head of the government in South Vietnam, a Catholic. You know how faithful he is in Catholicism? This guy's a faithful Catholic, probably better than a Bible believer, some of us Bible believers. Page 55, Manhattan writes, Diem was a genuine believer, considered the Catholic religion the only true religion, and had dedicated his life to its maintenance and propagation. He was so religious from his earliest childhood that at one time he wanted to become a Catholic priest, indeed a monk. Curiously enough, he did not enter the priesthood because the life of a priest was too soft. At 15, he spent some time in a monastery. He prayed two whole hours every day and attended mass regularly. There's nothing more dangerous than a person who really believes in what he believes. So Bible believers had that ever since the beginning. That's why the devil saw that, and so he used that to corrupt Christians and turn into Catholicism. It's a dangerous thing. Religion can be one of the most damnable, one of the most dangerous things right. you have to realize. Next to science. It's funny how atheist scientists always blame religion, but they don't realize their science was responsible for nuclear warfare, you know? So basically any tool or instrument used by man or belief could be used for the greater evil or greater good. Doesn't change that fact. Okay, so we read some interesting stuff about the Vietnam War on the Catholic powers involved. Now I'm going to go to the, the interesting back-to-back -back of these popes here. So Moscow, remember, they've been sending spies. It's not just the Vatican, and it's not just Americans. Moscow is sending spies as well. So guess what? They've been spying on the Vatican, not just USA. You know, people, they don't... You ever heard on the news how much they're paying attention to the Vatican? Who are they paying attention to? China, China, Russia, Russia, America, America. They don't pay attention to Mr. Little Old Vatican there. As soon as, uh, oh, the biggest one that they got caught was, you know, how they were uh, mistreating little kids. Yeah. That should have been really big. But you notice how just a couple of years, we, uh, not even a couple of years, just a couple of months, we soon forget it. Yeah. Wicked evil. I just want to sing Battle Hymn of the Protestant. Let's go. Mm -hmm. you know? <laughs> All right. Now, this is the Vatican-Moscow-Washington Alliance. This is the book by Avro Manhattan, a different book. And chapter 16, Stalin's plan for a red papacy. All right, I'm going to read to you about spies inside the Vatican. So Stalin sent spies on the Vatican. Now Stalin, you know, uh, you have to understand this. Uh, our Western governments, they make these uh, leaders, like the communists or other rogue nations, like they're dumb, like they're stupid. But you gotta realize this, they're in that, uh, People selected them as their leader for a reason. They make Hitler look dumb and stupid, but look how a dumb, stupid guy was kicking everybody's butts almost. I mean, he was up against all these other European powers. So the West, what they teach you in Western schools is not what they're really teaching you. They want to teach you like these guys are unintelligent, they don't know what they're talking about, but they don't realize how smart some of these brutal dictators are. Yeah. Stalin, he was no dummy. 
Page 121 and 122, Spies Inside the Vatican. In addition to such considerations, Stalin had processed certain information not available even to traditional diplomacy. In other words, if the Pope had his agents in Washington, Stalin had his own informants inside the Vatican. These were not the kind of agents so typical of the antediluvian Comintern and its related spy agencies. They were the very cream of the Kremlin special elite. Although a ruthless pragmatist, Stalin held unmarxist beliefs concerning the irrationality of human beha behavior, also in the potency of deeply held religious or ideological convictions. These, if adroitly employed, could work miracles. Additional information about the opinions, personal habits, physical dispositions, and monumental minutiae of certain individuals could do the rest. Now that's very important to understand. If you want to be a powerful leader, you got to have this little bit of psychology in you. Stalin had that. That's why he was stinking paranoid and killed everybody, including his loved ones. That's how much of a dreadful man he was. When you get so deep into that psychology thing, you don't trust anybody. Come on. So he's not, uh, he's not really like the, you know, the crazy, uh, unintelligent guy. No, he just got so deep into intelligence, he became a lunatic. You ever saw PhD people like that? Yeah. They pretend that, that there's no such thing. You know, you get so deep into intelligence, you become a loony. All right. Look how many of them attend counseling therapy. All right. Anyway, <laughs> such information had been collected from all over the Catholic world. The world's number one Catholic, Pius XII. All right. Don't forget this guy. All right. He's the one championing championing the extreme right causes. Uh, being the main target yielded the most. His visions and mystical visitations were as familiar to Stalin as they were to the editor of the Observatoire Romano or to the cardinal confidants who made them known to the world. Back in 1948 and 1949, this is interesting, listen. Back in 1948 and 1949, for instance, when Pius XII was fulminating against anyone who wished to vote for the communists, in the general elections of Italy and France, Stalin knew that the Pope was planning to proclaim a new dogma. So just by the Pope's attitude and behavior, Stalin can predict what the Pope would do next, you have to realize. Here's some more interesting stuff. I highlighted all of this because I want you to read the entire context to see how brilliant these guys are. Intelligence agencies, they should major a lot in psych psychology matters. But more significantly, he was aware that some cardinals were firmly opposed to it on religious as well as political grounds. As noted previously, the new dogma, the bodily assumption of the Virgin Mary, had been an act of piety on the part of Pius XII, but served at the time as a focus of political propaganda, as was his subsequent experience of the Fatima phenomena. Okay, so the Virgin Mary phenomenons are used to basically uh, rally up the Catholics and show them that, oh, you know, communism is wrong, the Catholic Church is right. That's what the Pope used these visions for. So Stalin obviously paid attention to that. Now Stalin discovered something differently. Some might think the Pope really believed his visions, but this is interesting. Stalin the materialist, page 123, regarded these manifestations as indications of physical and psychological ailments as clearly shown by the fact that following such visions, the Pope became the prey of fits of depression. These, Stalin was told, were relieved by an ever-increasing dose of drugs, some of which were considered dangerous. Yeah. It was even rumored, although the rumors were never confirmed, of course, that certain doctors, in their eagerness to ameliorate his distress, had administered overdoses of tranquilizers. The files of the Kremlin, no less than those of the CIA, contain accurate details about these developments. They were of immense political significance because they, were, they directly influenced the Pope's decisions concerning diplomatic and political matters of grave importance. So you gotta realize this, when Pope Pius was getting older, and he's claiming I'm getting these visions. 
dumb charismatics and Catholics were going, oh, it must be a real thing, but the atheist knew better. No, he's... Or he got some kind of doses of drugs. So I don't know if you got all that, all right? So I hope you were paying attention. Years later, it was reported that these periods of depression for the Pope developed into illness, which besides causing acute pain and recurrent discomfort, were thought to be the cause of mystical experiences of various kinds. In 1955, for example, during one of his serious illnesses, Pius claimed to have been visited by Christ in person. Quote, he saw the Lord close to him, silent in all his eloquent majesty, end of quote. And later, according to the Corriere della Sera, Italy's largest newspaper, the Holy Father also heard, quote, the true and distinct voice of Christ, end of quote. In Stalin's way of looking at things, because he obviously doesn't believe in that, such experiences indicated that the Pope's health was failing. So if he's failing, then what, what would the communists want? Are you following along or is this too deep for you? Come on. I hope you're following along. You've got to understand the pattern here, all right? Where, they're, where all these players are going at. In political terms, this meant that once Pius had passed from the scene, his anti-communist crusade would come to a halt, or at least ameliorate. The selection of a new pope would then assume a far-reaching significance not only to the church, but also to Washington and to Moscow. Page 124. The coming papal election, Stalin reflected, had to be planned in a more satisfactory way. That meant long-range lobbying, both within and outside the Vatican. The most acceptable papal candidate had to have a well-defined personality, possess the right kind of ideological bias that would have the approval of the progressive. This is where people are promoting about progressives, right, today? Progressive forces inside the church and be potentially attractive to a vigorous group of activists within the Roman hierarchy itself. Okay, so they need to take a pope that's you know not too left and not too right. That's the idea, but leaning toward the left. Page 126. Stalin's preference was for, this is the guy's name, Roncalli. Ever since his name was brought to his notice by the French communists. Torres, the French communist leader who had dealt personally with Roncalli, when the latter had been sent to France to appease de Gaulle, gave a glowing report to the Kremlin about him. He was the ideal prelate, he reported. He understood Marxism like a Marxist. He had no hard feelings against anybody. And if Marxism had not been sponsoring militant atheism, he might have been the best Christian comrade in the Catholic Church. So Catholic and communist, that's the idea. Whether Roncalli was aware of the attention he was receiving from the communist command center or not has never been disclosed. That he was sufficiently perceptive about his personal popularity with the leftists of Italy is an undisputed fact. Here are some examples. Italian socialists and communists were in frequent contacts with him at different levels. Some of them had direct lines of communication with the communist party chiefs and thus with Moscow. The leader of the Italian Communist Party, for example, Palmiro Togliati, considered Roncalli, you know, Stalin, who, uh, Stalin's guy for Pope, the ideal man for reaching a workable compromise between the church and socialism, and so reported during his frequent visits to Moscow. <laughs> okay, so see, Moscow was receiving intelligence. Page 130. Finally, the two Dulles brothers, supported by Spellman. All right, they're not going to have it, obviously, right? Mm -hmm. They don't want that kind of a pope. Asked for Roncalli's removal from the Vatican. Plausible reasons were given. <laughs> Health, age, gentle subversion. 
One day in 1953, Roncalli was given a cardinal's hat and then promptly transferred to the Patriarchate of Venice. So far as Pius XII, the Dulles brothers, and Cardinal Spellman were concerned, that should have been the end of the pro-Russian prelate. Now interred in a political backwater where the best he could look forward to was an honorable death, unremembered and harmless. All right, good riddance, right? Page 132. This information was imparted to the author by a person who was well informed about the Kremlin's thinking on the matter. He was first secretary of the Russian embassy in London, who was in a very, spe very pe special position to know. He had been put into the diplomatic service by Stalin himself, a fellow Georgian. His observation proved to be very accurate, as we shall have occasion to prove presently. That's why Avril Manhattan's book have been accepted by even some government officials. Because he's a, a rich elite himself, I think he was dubbed or called Knights of Malta, honorary. But this guy, Avril Manhattan, he had connection with all these elites. So he know that's all this material he's getting, he's getting from his communications with them. So I told you that before. I, don't forget that, all right? Mm -hmm. In 1958, Pope Pius XII's successor ascended the throne of St. Peter. Okay, so who took over Pope Pius XII? To the surprise and dismay of many, he was the exiled and almost forgotten Cardinal Roncalli. Stalin's favorite old candidate. The conclave had been a laborious one. The fight for Roncalli's election was a heated one. It had taken no fewer than 11 ballots to reach a final choice. Washington's lobbying had been outwitted and had come into action when it was too late. Page 132 to 133, some observers predicted that the new pontiff would destroy the church and the first omen of his pontificate could not have been more indicative. He chose the name of a 15th century anti-pope, John the 23rd, left now. He switched. The assessment of the conservative element as well as that of the Soviet embassy official in London and others in, Ro in Rome was proved to be correct. The Catholic Church would never be the same. No. Again. So notice all of a sudden now is switched to left. So let's see right here. Page. Now I'm reading Vietnam, Why Did We Go to War? Uh, back at Avril Manhattan's other book. And this will be on page, let's see right here. Uh, hopefully it will be 156. So let me go over here. So I had to do a lot of reading and research. That way you can all understand what's going on, the structure here, the framework. It's important to get that. That way all the other details of history that you're going to read. Listen, when you look at our current events today and our 20th century history of what you're going to learn in your schools, if you remember this framework that I told you, you're not, your perspective is going to be very different from the liberals, what they hear. It's going to be totally different after this. So you have to remember this framework that I teach you. It's going to change everything on how you, how you read or study history after this. All right, so here is uh, Cardinal Spellman. So what happened to John Dulles? What happened to Cardinal Spellman? Spellman? What happened to their plan? All right, this is page 160, page 160 on the book, Vietnam, Why Did We Go to War by Manhattan? The most successful recruiter of them all was a master builder of political intrigues, Cardinal Spellman of New York, whom we have already encountered. Spellman was a personal friend of Pius XII and also of the two Dulles brothers, Although his relationship with them had been purposely minimized, he acted as a very confidential intermediary between the State Department and the CIA and the Vatican. The Dulles brothers sent Spellman to the Vatican to conduct the most delicate negotiations and often used him to dispatch very personal communications directly and exclusively to the Pope himself. On more than one occasion, in fact, this is interesting, it was reported that Spellman was charged with strictly oral communication with the Pope 
to avoid any written or telephonic devices because of leaks. When pi, po, uh, page 163, this is interesting, and then we'll close it off here. When Pope Pius XII died in 1958, Cardinal Stellman's operations multiplied. Okay, so he died, what's gonna happen now, right? Cardinal Stellman, remember, he's very powerful. His operations actually multiplied, as did his lobbying on Capitol Hill. Their rumors were heard about him becoming the first American Pope. Stellman never scotched the rumors since he secretly entertained a long-standing ambition to the papacy. Indeed, he confidently expected that the cardinals at the forthcoming conclave would select him as the successor of Pius XII in recognition of his effective diplomatic anti-communist efforts, which he had so successfully conducted on behalf of the deceased pope and the State Department. Spellman was a firm, uh, Spellman was a firm believer in the prophecies of St. Malachi, the 12th century Irish prophet, and had taken such prophecies about the papacy with the utmost seriousness. This is interesting. If some of you knew about St. Malachi's prophecy and about end times, about this number of pope where the end of the world will come, it's so interesting. So Spellman believed this. St. Malachi had characterized each pope from his day onwards with a Latin tag indicating the basic characteristics of each pontificate. He had distinguished the successor to Pius XII as what? Pastor et Nalta, shepherd and navigator. During the conclave of 1958, Spellman's papal ambitions became the talk of Rome. Encapsulated in a current joke, Spellman, so the joke went, had hired a boat, filled it with sheep, and sailed up and down the river Tiber in the belief that he was helping the fulfillment of the prophecy. The result <laughs> of the election was anything but what Cardinal Spellman had expected. Cardinal Roncalli, the Patriarch of Venice, became the new Pope John XXIII. So what happened? The contrast between Pius XII and Pope John XXIII could not have been more striking. The partnership between Washington and the Vatican, remember they partnered up, the, it's called the Vatican-Washington Alliance, collapsed almost overnight. Cardinal Spellman was banished almost at once from the papal antechamber. No longer was he the welcome and frequent messenger from the two most ferocious anti-communist Dulles brothers. His sudden banishment from the Vatican was such a personal blow to his inner pride that he never recovered from it for the rest of his life. The State Department was no less shocked and worried at what might follow. The Vatican under Pope John had completely reversed its former policy. The U.S. Vatican anti-communist strategy had crashed in a matter of days. The result of such unexpected disaster was unpredictable and was bound to force the U.S. to reshape its own anti-communist grand strategy from top to bottom. While the U.S. was considering how to do so, two events of major importance had taken place in Vietnam and the U.S. itself. In Vietnam, Diem, remember that guy who took over, who took care of South Vietnam? Thanks to his protectors, had become president and had begun to consolidate his regime with an able mixture of religious motivation and acts of political ruthlessness. In the U.S., Kennedy, Diem's former sponsor, had entered the White House as the first Catholic president in American history. The hopes of Cardinal Spellman were partially and briefly revived. His dream that a Catholic president would help to consolidate the Catholic presidency of Vietnam soon came to nothing. And you wonder why he died. You wonder why Kennedy died later on, right? Anyway, anyway, and remember, a lot of Catholics in CIA Anyway, 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 I'm not concluding, just, I'm not jumping to conclusions here. While Kennedy played a waiting game about what to do with his Catholic presidential counterpart in Vietnam, the latter had started to irk American public opinion with his repressive anti-Buddhist operations. What happened is, and you can read it yourself, I'm not going to read it, Buddhists were, you, you notice, uh, you ever saw, uh, saw them lighting fires on themselves for protests? That came from those Buddhists because Diem was persecuting them. So because Buddhists were doing that, the American public was horrified. That changed everything. So then, they're in trouble now. 
So then they had to switch courses. They had to switch courses. Who did Pope John Twenty Third hold hands with? Ho Chi Minh. Oh, wow. I will read proof of that later. This Vatican, I'm telling you, is the most demon-possessed organization in the planet. It holds hands with anything evil. The most evil organizations you can ever think of, 90% or 80% of the time, smell a Catholic behind it. Completely evil. Completely evil. You know why? That's how they survive. They have to go by elites, no matter what religion it is. Did you forget the Jesuit oath? I will be Protestant, Mason, Jew, Christian, whatever, to fulfill my final cause for the Mother Church. Every head bow, every eye shot. Who wants prayer, all right? Altar calls open, all right? Father God, I pray that tonight's teaching has been eye-opening about our history. May we not be uh, dumb prey to the systems of our government with the public, how they go. We know it's all a game, Father. It's a game of kingdom builders and e devil's elites. And Lord, all we're doing is we're not a part of that, Lord. We're just doing our job. We're building your spiritual kingdom. Saving souls from this wicked system, the God of this world, as much as we can. And looking forward to that kingdom you're building up above. And, most of, and also, this kingdom you'll take over one day. Amen. You'll wipe them all out, Lord, and you'll set up your own rightful amen. kingdom one day. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. amen.